Hello and welcome to another episode of Under the Spotlight. This series, brought to you by the uh, Manchester Media Group, is asking major pl- figures around Manchester the questions that you want to be answered. Today I'm joined by Afzal Khan MP for Gorton. Thank you for coming to speak to us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here with the Manchester Media Group. <laughs> wow. Could you just um, start by explaining a bit of what you do around the area for the constituents? Well, basically, I'm a member of parliament for Manchester Gorton. And when you say Gorton, people just think maybe it's just the Gorton area. But actually, no, the name is for the whole constituency. So for just your viewers, it's sort of almost like the big roundabout on Thames side into Gorton, Abbey Hay, coming down to Longside, then to Levin Zoom, and then to a little bit Burnage, and then coming over. It's Russian fellow field where we have lots of students. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then a little bit Moss side, a uh, little bit uh, Wally Range, a full Wally Range, and a little bit Cholton. So, so it's quite a big area. Um, and what do I do? Well, as a member of parliament, of course, uh, my job is to represent the people of this area of Manchester Gorton, and that means almost anything, everything. Um, but it's not my first job. I mean, I, I've been doing lots of other things as well. Uh, most of my life is from Manchester, and I've been bus driver and working for Greater Manchester Transport. Now, that's going back a little bit. <laughs> but then I was also a police officer. Uh, again, I served in Manchester, so I know the area well and from a different perspective. I was also a solicitor, again worked in Manchester, so I know the opposite side as well. Uh, and then as a councillor, then I was also Lord Mayor of Manchester. I was the first Asian Lord Mayor. Uh, and then I became a member of European Parliament. I uh, served this area again to the whole Northwest. And then now since 2017, uh, I've been a member of Parliament for much to go to, but I also have national roles. So I did different things again. I've been a Shadow Immigration Minister, I've been a Shadow Foreign Office Minister, I've been a Deputy Leader of the House Shadow, and currently my role is the Shadow Justice Minister. So I deal with issues with justice. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, I just want to start firstly with some student news. Your, like you said, a lot of your constituency covers areas that a lot of students choose to live while studying in Manchester. Now, even with the government support schemes in place, last year the Millie Group Plus Group estimated that the cost of living crisis could mean that around 300,000 students will be struggling to pay for their rent, their food, and you know, resulting in some people having to drop out of university because of the cost of living crisis. Neither Labour nor the Conservatives seem to have put forward a plan specifically for students in this situation. What do you think the government could do to support students directly? Well, the first thing I want to say to you is you're spot on uh, by identifying this whole area. But I will say to you is actually the issues the students are facing is actually a lot more. This is just one aspect, which itself is pretty bad. Uh, I I think being a a young person this day and age with what's happening all around, lots of different ways there's been a huge negative impact on young people. Uh, And and therefore, we should be concerned about this. And when I'm saying there's other areas, well, I'll start with, you know, we had Brexit. Now, that itself, I thought, was a big one for young people. Because uh, without the breakfast, when we were part of the European Union, for me, the idea was, for, especially for young people, you know, you could get up and go anywhere in the 28 countries, not only enjoy yourself, explore it, but you could work there and study there, you could do all those things. You could do a bit here and a bit there and all that stuff as well to really enrich your life. Uh, so an opportunity point of view is, you know, that's been difficult. Uh, then we had a horizon funding, which was again a lot of money there on research, etc. Again, you would have young people who will be at the f- at forefront of this area. So again, it will be an area which will affect, you know, down the road. So I think that was a big one for young people. And I'm sure many will be disappointed that they have had less opportunities now compared to the previous generations. And then when you come into the education side, again, you know, this whole idea of fees, that's a lot. You know, uh, whilst I acknowledge, you know, when you're studying, you do a degree, you benefit from it, and yes, it increases your prospects of a better living, better wage, all that. But ultimately, the society also benefits. So therefore, it's a win-win. Education to me is pretty important, and it's uh, important to open doors. 
you know, to, it's like a ladder going up. So in all those aspects, that education side, I think is again where it's been hit. Uh, and I think having more and more loans, it just puts you back. You know, it's there uh, saddling you with this debt for so long. So it's that issue as well. Um, and then I think you come into the government. We've had this current government, it's like a Tory government, 13 years now almost, you know, wow. Year after year, young people have been having the brunt of this as well. Uh, and that brunt again is, you know, all the services, facilities, uh, young people's facilities in the community, all have been eroding. Uh, cuts, 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 year after year. Uh, and then after 13 years, they're talking about more cuts. How is this acceptable? Yeah. And then if you add into then pandemic, that was another big one which hit the young people. You know, uh, if you're young, you know, it's such a large chunk of life being taken out where you're isolated. And the whole education system set up, everybody was struggling, the exams, all that. So there's been all that huge. And then now cost of living. You know, you already have a limited amount of money and then everything is going up, up, up. Uh, when the f food is going up, uh, traveling costs is going up, the rents are going up. I know in Manchester, again, it's been pretty steep. So it's all adding up, isn't it? So I, I feel really bad, personally, that what's happening. And government is doing bits and pieces, but overall, it's nowhere near what needs to happen. And that's why, wherever I have an opportunity, I do go around, speak to young people, encourage them, you know, to give them some hope, uh, and then also to speak wherever I can on their behalf in Parliament. Thank you for that. You've touched on... Um, international students from the EU, but I'm just going to ask you more generally about. No, but it affected our students as well. Well, yeah. You know, we could have gone to there. That's what I meant. But so recently, Suella Braverman announced that she thinks that there's too many international students coming to the UK and bringing people with them, <coughs> settling in the UK. Now, international students bring around 27 billion pounds into the economy every year. Not a small amount, is it? <laughs> Do you think that, that suggesting that there should be a cap sends the right message to people wanting to come to study in the UK? For me, uh, look, I, I, I used to be a shadow immigration minister a number of years back, uh, but someone uh, who has been involved with education, when I was a counsellor, I was also the lead member for children's services, so basically it covered uh, students. And then I was on Board of Governors for seven years in Manchester University. So I know firsthand the benefit uh, the students actually bring to the wider students, so the overseas students actually, enrich us. And we also got to think about it in this sense, that you know the fees they pay is two, three times more than home student. So it's a net money coming in which helps our whole students in the sense of institutions, universities, to provide better facilities. And then, if you think about it, these students coming from overseas are usually the cream of that society of other countries. So you're getting them to come here to mix with all our students and to benefit one another. So you are enriching the student life yeah? And then on top of that, once they qualify, they contribute with their research and everything, they will go back to their country, whichever country may be globally. All the rest of their life, you have this amazing soft power where you have connections of those people who have come and studied here. And many of these students then go on to become very high-powered individuals, whether that's a prime minister or minister or other things. And that's an amazing bonus for us as a country, that connection uh, which is there. So I think uh, in the short term, it's a stupid idea what she's talking about. She doesn't understand the wider context. And in the medium to long term, our needs, you know, of the research, connectivity, the global village that we're talking about the world is, we need those connections for us to have a strong economy, prosperous Britain. So it just doesn't add up at all to me, other than this narrow, backward thinking Tory party trying to satisfy their own supporters who don't have a much wider vision of the world. Students 
are at the forefront of a lot of protest movements. They get involved in protests quite a lot, and quite a lot of students are beginning to fear that the police are overstretching their powers to clamp down on protests. You mentioned earlier in your introduction that you've worked within the police. <laughs> yes. What would, you, what would you say would be an acceptable way to police protest him? Well, I think, for me, uh, I believe that the idea of British policing is pretty good. And that idea is, you know, from within own your community, serving your own community idea. So far as the serving idea is concerned, that I think is brilliant and we should keep up with that. The community connection of the police, etc. we should encourage all that. Then the second element is, you could have individual bad police officers, you know, abuse the power. I've seen this, I've been in the police force myself. So again, that is a sort of disciplinary idea and the system that we have, check and balances within the police to make sure those bad apples are weeded out quickly as possible and dealt with, so they don't give a bad uh, name to the whole force. We need this strong cooperation between the police and the community. They are there for us and that relationship needs to be strong. So I think that I'm also clear on. And then the third thing I think is probably the power idea. And then again we need to make sure that there is a balance of those powers and the government needs to be clear that you don't use police as a tool for your ideas and that they don't drag them into those sort of areas. So less where we need to keep an eye on and we need to make sure the police are there to serve the public. Serve and protect should be the key central theme. Now, the UCU has recently announced that it's going to be going on and well, it's going to have 18 days worth of strike action starting on the 1st of February. This will be the fourth consecutive year that students will have had their studies interrupted by striking. Um, what would you say to the students who are beginning to find these disruptions just a bit annoying in order so that they can continue to support workers pushing for better conditions? Yeah, I think it's a difficult one. Difficult in a sense like this. Of course, the student life is a limited life in the sense that the time you spend and you're here for a number of purposes which should be fulfilled. And one of those is, of course, the backbone is the education aspect of it. And if there's such unrest in the teaching staff of it, that has an impact. Now, on the other side, you know, I struggle by saying for any worker that they shouldn't have a right to protect their job, that they shouldn't have a right to protect the conditions of that job and to protect their wages, you know, with all the difficulties, with inflation, double digit going on, with the stagnation with that's going on. I think all of us are struggling with that and therefore, you know, it's a fundamental right for those state unions to take a collective action in order to make sure they protect in the long term. But I think the responsibility then also comes on the, the universities. Uh, they need to make sure as well that there is a meaningful discussion taking place and trying to resolve this so that we don't end up with years and years of uh, this disturbance, uh, the strikes. Uh, and the government also needs to make sure that there are sufficient fundings available for universities. Uh, so that we can have smooth running. Now, student safety and misogyny are two big issues that students care about at this university, as well as the universities and throughout society as a whole. <coughs> um, in the past, you've expressed that you think misogyny should be counted as a hate crime. I think, in principle, a lot of people would support this. But I just want you to sort of expand on that and talk about what would actually count as a misogynistic crime. How would you how would you police that? What would the punishments be? Sort of. Yeah, but look, uh, first of all, I'm not necessarily an expert in this area, but for me, there's a very simple broad issue. And that broad issue is every individual in society, every human being is special and is unique. And we need to have a society where the threat of fairness goes through it all. And that fairness then means we treat each other with respect, 
we make sure everyone has equal opportunities. We make sure we have a society, everyone is free to move around to do the things, to make most of the life, basically. So that is my core central positioning on these areas. So wherever I see any form of bigotry, discrimination, uh, hate, I will challenge that. And I've done that all my life. And I know there are different aspects of this and different people serve, uh, suffer in different ways. Uh, so anything I can do to push that, that's my agenda. And I'll carry on doing this. And listen, there are many people uh, who are experts in this area who can then sort of uh, define this much better than I can and refine it in a way that it actually balances things out fairly. Ultimate thrust has to be is this idea of fairness about justice, where everyone is treated with respect and equality and equal opportunities. Now, ultimately, that comes down to, like you say, treating people with respect and equality. Um, there's a lot of stu female students who don't feel that they can go on the streets at night on their own safely. What do you think could be done to improve street safety for students? Yeah. Well, look, I think there will probably be layers in here. Uh, one uh, simple point where I'm going at uh, with this uh, here is education idea. You know, we all as a society need to be educated of this idea of fairness, equality and all this. And that I think we can all do at home with our friends, anywhere you see it uh, challenging, challenging it, you know. So all those responsibilities there on every single one. And then there are things which we can do collectively as well. And that would mean the universities playing their part as well. I mean community organizations playing their part, the city council playing their part, police playing their part, and collectively working together where we make sure that happens. And then making sure there are legislations, the tools are there as well to provide that protection to them the bit I talked about the police before, so they can be enforced as well. By working together collectively like this, I think we can have a better Britain, a better world. As it stands, the next election is in 2024. Um, can you confirm that you'll be standing again? And if so, what will you be camping on specifically for your area? I can confirm. Uh, I will be standing again. Uh, I feel uh, honoured and privileged uh, that again and again, People of uh, the city have uh, shown their trust in my positionings, whether it was a councillor, whether it was when I was a Lord Mayor, whether it was an executive member, whether I was a European member, MP. So I, I, I feel humbled and uh, I will do that. And I've always moved on the basic idea that uh, you're there to serve. Uh, and in my philosophy in my office, my staff, is always simple. You know, if anyone contacts us with any issues, we will do our best to serve and to deliver for them. Uh, and that has been my key motto. So whatever those issues, challenges are, I will always be available and I will always give my 100% to make that difference for them. On a wider issue, well, what's happening? Well, I think, look, uh, we've gone through very difficult patch. Having this 13 years, of cuts from this conservative government has been painful. I have seen this city being, being built. I've seen some of these amazing schools being built, new ones. I've seen some of these amazing hospital buildings being built. I've seen the show start and facilities like that also being built. I've seen an amazing public services there. And then I've seen year after year cuts. So I think, you know, how do we restore those public services? Uh, it's going to be difficult uh, with the mess they have made, uh, the debts they're going to leave. It's going to take some time. But I think that is a sort of, of uh, the key fiber uh, of our society, having those good public services, which we all use and benefit. And then I think it's about, you know, we have a lot of young people in Manchester. So how do we make sure we improve on their education, we make sure they improve their attainments, how do we make sure we improve on their opportunities, uh, how do we make sure we match their skill base with the jobs that are available in the city, so that basically they have a smooth transfer from education into the working life, and then to progress further with good high paid jobs, etc. So that would be something which I would uh, work on. Uh, and then a much 
uh, on a wider arching bit, I find, and I find it troubling, for so many decades now, there are so many of our Mancunians who actually struggle with poverty, and poverty is the biggest evil. It affects every aspect of the life. So how do we really work with it in a sort of systematic way to slowly, it's not easy, it takes time, but actually turn this around so that we do manage to eliminate this, or if not, we can't do that, then at least to reduce it, minimize, but not going the other way around where, you know, we are seeing the food banks running out of food. How is that acceptable in this 21st century in a Britain, which is one of the richest countries in the world, there's something fundamentally wrong with this idea of fairness in society, and something like this is what I'll always challenge and try to make a difference. This week, the Scottish Government was blocked by the UK Government from implementing a bill that would allow 16 and 17 year olds to get a gender rec recognition certificate based on self-identification. Why did Labour abstain from taking a side? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the, the key point to understand is it basically wasn't necessarily the subject matter why we abstained. The real issue, the way it was framed, that debate, it was to do with the use of this power, Section 35 order. So it was specifically for that uh, and why we abstained. On the substantial matter itself you touched on, I think, again, two things I would say. One is I find it is uh, troubling that this is another area. They're basically in backward-looking government. They're not progressive, and therefore they keep kicking issues like of fairness and equality into the long grass. And this is what they've been doing. They should have done this. They should look at this, you know, uh, for many years now. They're not actually bothered doing that. So the whole subject itself, you're not dealing with it, is where I would put the, the blame on, on the government. But on the other issue which concerns me is, I believe generally the idea of devolving power, devolving power where it gets closest to the people, the more we can do, the better. And in this context, we have done that with the, the Scottish Parliament. So again, we've got to be very careful with this, how we use these powers, you know. You can't one hand give that power, and then on the other hand, you block it. Then the question is, well, why are you giving it for? Is it genuine power, yeah? So, so, so there is the whole issue there. Uh, and then the final point I would say is, again, with what has been happening in the last 12, 13 years, this uh, strong unity that we've had in Great Britain in the United Kingdom of the four nations, I feel the government is endangering that. So this nationalistic movements of separation moving away, you're giving them more strength. So you've got to be careful, you know, uh, of this uh, unity that we have and uh, we need to work at it. Don't undermine it. And I feel the things, some of the things the Tory governments are doing are risking that. And that's really bad, that's serious. But ultimately, would you in principle support self-identification for 16 and 17 year olds like the Scottish Parliament does? Well, look, I'm, I'm looking forward for this debate to be brought to uh, Parliament. Uh, like I said, I'm concerned that they've been kicking in the long grass. And my positioning on matters like this is uh, always, I wait till the debate is there, I then follow the whole debate, I read around the whole debate, I listen to the experts, and then I make my mind up at that time. There is arguments around this, you know, at what age, etc., and what are the pros and cons. And that argument I didn't want to listen to much more closely when the whole debate actually takes place. But again, on a broad point of view, um, you know, if you can have a 16-year-old you know, uh, in, it's like for example in Scotland, get married. <laughs> if you can have 16 year old join the army, yeah, uh, and 16 year old can work and pay taxes, so all sorts of those things are happening, then, you know, we need to look at this. Uh, and I also think this argument also goes into a number of other areas, you know, whether or not the age of voting should be lowered, 
You know, that's again an interesting idea. Again, if you're paying the taxes, well, why not? Yeah. So I think there's a whole area uh, which needs to be looked at. Uh, for me, I would like the government to you know, stop kicking the ball in there, bring the legislation forward, let's have a proper debate on it, let's listen to the different people's opinions, let's listen to the experts as well, and then let's come to a conclusion on it and then move forward. And lastly, um, recently Keir Starmer went on LBC and told the listeners that, they sh- that they're reviewing the under-25 reduced uh, free bus pass promise that was promised in the 2019 manifesto, adding that he wants people to see the 20 manifest, 2019 manifesto is gone. When we spoke to Andy Burnham, he told us that if he can, if he, can he will be looking at reducing uh, bus fares for students. These two things t- seem like they're opposing each other. What do you think the Labour Party should do? Well, uh, okay, from my perspective, yeah, probably I sit closer to Andy Burnham in this subject. And I think I also understand Keir, where he's coming from. While, you know, uh, Andy Burnham has to look at, at a level of Greater Manchester, Keir has to look at the whole country. <laughs> uh, and, and any decision he makes, uh, it has a costing implication. And again, with the whole many challenges that we discussed even t- today with you, all have costing implications. And with the sort of fixed envelope, how do you divide that up? What takes priority at that time over something else? That's a decision which has to be made. Uh, on a journey point of view, yes. Yeah? But on the Pacifics, when we come to a manifesto and we have to make sure it's all costed, otherwise, you know, the Tories will use that as an excuse. They're saying that, look, that look at them, yeah? So we've got to have a robust, um, costed manifesto which stacks up, so which gives people a clear choice. What will be the difference under the Labour government? Uh, so I understand the, why I would Keir would be cautious at this stage. But I can assure you, Keir wants to make a difference. He wants to make sure things are better. Keir understands how difficult it is for young people. And I am sure Keir also understands many benefits that drive for uh, having a better transport system, which encourages more and more people to use it. And especially the young people, you know, who, who have so much energy, who move around, who do go to work, who play around, do those things. They need that transport system. So, yeah, anything we can do to improve that, uh, you'll see I'll be there supporting it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us today. 